Our text for today is taken from the book of Amos, the third chapter, beginning with the first verse. <clears throat> Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? Will a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den when he has caught nothing? Will a bird fall into a snare on the earth when there is no trap for it? Or will a snare spring up from the earth if it has not caught, if it has not caught nothing at all? If a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people be afraid? If there is calamity in a city, will not the Lord have done it? Surely the Lord does, God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. A lion has roared, who will not fear. The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy. Heavenly Father, sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If you're a student of the Old Testament, and Amos is a very different book of the Old Testament, most of the books in the Old Testament were written by judges, kings, prophets, weren't they? The book of Amos is written by a farmer. A farmer who God called to preach his word And we're going to learn a little bit more about Amos and what his unique ministry was like because he was given a unique ministry. And I especially want to focus on the words that he ends in chapter 8. The Lord has spoken. That's a different phrase than everything else we hear of from most of the prophets in the Old Testament. In the Hebrew language, Most of the prophets, when they are giving the message that God gave them, say, thus says the Lord, or koamar Adonai. Basically saying, you can not listen to it if you want, but you better take that up with God. Good luck with that. That's the intention behind that. Amos is talking about himself. The Lord has spoken. How can I not prophesy? Well, what is Amos talking about? Amos is from a place called Tekoa, and you only ever hear of it maybe once or twice in Scripture. Tekoa was just south of Jerusalem. And so what, and it was, you know, it's one of these no stop light towns. The only thing that Tekoa is ever recorded for, other being Amos' hometown, is that David stationed a garrison there in case anybody from the south would come up against Israel. And because it's kind of a military town then, even in Amos' day, Amos uses a military phrase. When we hear in the New Testament, or when we hear in our days about a trumpet sounding, this is the thing that they were talking about, a shofar. And you would blow into this to let the people in Jerusalem know that an enemy is coming. Or you would also blow into this to give your army directions for a retreat or an advance, etc. There would be one blow, retreat, two blows, advance, etc. But this is the kind of thing, not the trumpet that we're used to seeing people play, necessarily in our day and age, but this is the battle cry. So if we think about it, Amos is using some of these images that he saw in his everyday life. Who and what is Amos? Amos is again from Tekoa in the southern area 
And of course, the Lord told him to go preach to Israel in the north. He was a sheep breeder and a farmer, sycamore fig trees, a fig farmer. He is not a trained prophet. And I'll be honest with you, when we read Hebrew, we read Amos in the Hebrew language in college. It's not an easy Hebrew when you're used to the trained writers who wrote the rest of the Bible. And it uses a lot of imagery of the common man because that's what Amos was. And that's the imagery he gives us in our text. As a farmer, he would have to fix things so he would know a little bit about construction. So he talks about a plumb line. You're probably more used to a chalk line when you build something, right? To make sure it's straight and level. He uses those kinds of images in his book. Why? To say that, Israel, your house is not plumb. You're not going the right direction. You're not straight with God. And he can use all of these imagery, images from real life, things that the normal person would understand. He raised fig trees, or was a farmer of sycamore fig fruit. He uses the picture of selling scales when you go to buy grain. And he says to Israel, your scales are off. You're trying to cheat one another. All of the basic things that God has called you to be, you've broken from him. You cheat one another. You steal. And let alone the fact that you put golden calves in what used to be two holy cities, Bethel, where Jacob saw the stairway to heaven, the ladder, and in Gilgal. Now golden calves were being worshipped in Israel, in places where holy things had happened prior. What does he do? Amos is just minding his own business and he gets called by God to the north and to preach. Probably because there were no faithful people in the north anymore. So God had to send somebody from the south up north. And we know that the northern kingdom was the one that was first destroyed. And because the southern kingdom was destroyed by a later conqueror, the one that destroyed the northern tribes had the practice of spreading out the people from every nation that they conquered so that they were taken away from their homeland. And that's why we have in history the diaspora, the sending of the Jewish people into all these different areas where Paul would eventually go and where missions would start and why you get Jewish enclaves in all these other countries all over the world. God didn't want to hurt his people. And he says that in Amos. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. You're the ones that I blessed. The ones that I called out of slavery in Egypt. The ones that I said you would be my people. But you're not being my people. Amos does something interesting in his book. He says, you know, for all the sins of all the other nations, God is going to get angry with them. He says, guess what, Israel? You're in that same boat. Because you're doing all the same things that evil nations do. Unlike the false prophets who told them that everything was fine, Amos was a true prophet of God. And here we get back to those words. If God has spoken, how can I not speak? 
And especially when we think about the ministry and all the false prophets that we see in our world who are telling people they're just fine. When Jesus says to us in our gospel text, you cannot serve God and mammon, you cannot have two masters, which one are you going to serve? <coughs> Amos has an interesting phrase here in our text. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? Do you know what that word synod means? We're in the Evangelical Lutheran Synod. We're in fellowship with the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. That word synod in the Greek means to walk together or to walk with. Can we walk together if we're not agreed? <clears throat> or like other synods that just say, well, we just agree to disagree. And we'll call it good. There's a siren going off through Amos. And I want that picture in your head. I use that word siren. Why? Because when we hear a tornado siren, what does that mean? <laughs> to some idiots, it means go outside and look, right? To most of the rest of us, we would hope, it would mean that we would go downstairs or find someplace safe to be. And yeah, there's that Twister movie. That's how I get right. I just caught the connection. <clears throat> in fact, while I was on vacation this summer, the tornado sirens went off and we went down to the basement in the lake and held up, you know, hung out there for a while until we knew it was safe. Amos uses that same picture. A trumpet has blown in the city. Danger is coming. And I'm the one who's here to blow that trumpet for you. To wake you up. To get you to see that you're not on the same path as God wants you to be. The lion in the wilderness. When does he roar? Not while he's hunting his prey, but after he's killed his prey to let the other lionesses know that they can come and feast too, that he's conquered. Something's been consumed or killed by the lion. That's why he roars. And again, it's a warning call that there's a lion out there. And he's already killed once. Are there a lot of things that we can apply that Amos talks about to today? Yes. And it's easy if we want to just to focus on everybody else's sins and warning our own selves too, not to get consumed into these things. which our world is so easily tangled up in. Yes, there is that. But today I want you to focus a little bit more on <clears throat> when we pray the Lord's Prayer, are we really asking that God's will be done? Do we mean it? Amos was just minding his business and God comes to him and says, go speak. And so what does he do? He goes and speaks. <laughs> I was reminded about my own call day and I know that my mom and Julie were not really happy that I was gonna be sent up to the West Coast away from them. But I also have to remember, I was at a call day service where one of my cousins was going to get a sign. And one of the students, a young lady was, her name was read off and she was assigned out to Washington as a Christian teacher, Christian day school teacher. 
And we heard her mother in the whole auditorium, Washington! That's so far away. God's not even asking us to go to a different country or somewhere else right now, but are we afraid to speak his word? Or Lord, only, only if it's under a certain set of circumstances will I have the guts to say your word. And yeah, there are a lot of people out there in the world that are going to hate us because that we have to preach the law as well. But, but, do we see the faith that Amos, a simple man, had? Do we understand the faith that he was calling the people in the north back to? that God was using this man to reach out to lost sinners. And it's an easy, it's a crazy thing because, yeah, we know that the Lord was displeased with them and dispersed them throughout the world. But, What did Paul find when he went out to these places? He found Jews and he started preaching among them. And many of the Jews followed and listened to the gospel message. The descendants of these people from the north that were spread out across the world realized that what Amos had said to them and what some of the other prophets who had warned them about these things, that they were true. And the false prophets who were telling them that everything was okay, they were false. And so they had passed that faith on down to their children. And if you think of Timothy, here's someone whose Jewish family got intermarried with a Greek family and yet the Jewish mother and grandma raised him to know God. And he becomes one of Paul's disciples and eventually pastor, bishop. The Lord didn't leave them or say, I'm done with you, did he? He came back and visited them. And it's interesting, you know, there's times in our lives when we get a little lost. Maybe we remember back to our college years when, yeah, we didn't really put church high on the priority list. Or other times in our lives. And yet God doesn't leave us there, does he? Through some way, shape, or form, he calls out to us, doesn't he? And I'll be honest with you, it's not every time that that's coming from a pastor, is it? What is our job? Even the simple man or woman. To share Jesus with a world that doesn't know him. And they might even claim that they know him. But if they're not walking with him, they need a reminder to come back. A couple times this summer, I traveled with my children. And I'll kind of leave this wherever it is. And I've never been a big country music fan or a fan of some of the other forms of music or entertainment. And, and here I'm on a several hour trip with my son, Caleb. 
and he's got one of the famous, one of the popular country songs, I'd rather be in my boat thinking about God than in church thinking about fishing, is basically the lyrics to the song. And of course, he was playing it as we were going to go fishing, get away from here for a little while. And yet, isn't that sometimes our attitude towards God and his word? Well, what about the times I need to go have some fun? And yeah, everybody needs to take a vacation from now, now and again. And yes, I'm not saying that. But if that's our main idea always in life, well, when can I go party? <clears throat> One of the themes in Amos is you can't wait for the harvest to get harvest festival to be done. You can't wait for Sabbath to be over because you're not interested in what God has to offer. You're interested in what you can do once the Sabbath is over. Where was their heart? And then you take a look at a simple farmer. Well, if God's spoken, how do I not respond? Lord, give us such a faith as this simple man. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all our human understanding, let that peace be with our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.